Hi everybody, Dr. Ankur Arora this side. In this presentation, we will be discussing about the anatomy of mandibular denture bearing area. The mandibular denture poses a technical challenge for the dental surgeon. It also is a great management challenge for the patient. The principles of impression making are same as that for a maxillary denture. Denture base extends as far as possible without interfering with the health or function of the tissues. Tongue poses a challenge by complicating the impression procedures and the patient's ability to manage the mandibular denture, thus threatening retention of a mandibular denture. The anatomy of supporting structures will be discussed under the following headings, crest of residual alveolar ridge, buccal shelf area, and shape of the supporting structures. The crest of residual ridge is covered by mucous membrane but the underlying bone is cancellous bone. The cancellous bone can't bear too much stress, hence less resistant to the absorption. Therefore this becomes a secondary stress bearing area. This is the crest of the residual alveolar ridge. Next anatomic landmark to be discussed is the buccal shelf area. The area marked by the red dotted line in this picture of mandibular cast depicts the buccal shelf area. The buccal shelf area basically is the area between the buccal frenum and the anterior border of the masseter. Midly, the crest of residual alveolar ridge is present. Laterally, external oblique ridge. This side will be the external oblique ridge. It's not so evident in this photograph. And distally, this side is retromolar pad present. So basically, you see that this hole is the area, it's known as buccal shelf area, on both the sides. I've shown you on one side, similarly extends on the other side also. Like this. Clinical significance. Though the mucosa overlying it is less keratinized and not ideal to provide support, it can be a stress because the bone of this area has a layer of cortical bone overlying. We all know that the cortical bone is more stronger than the cancellous bone and is able to withstand more pressure. Second reason, it lies at a right angle to the vertical occlusal forces. Now the bone is able to better withstand stress which is produced on it at right angles than other angles. Third reason, the inferior part of buccinator muscle is attached to the buccal shelf area of the mandible but the orientation of these fibers is parallel to the denture. Because of this parallel orientation of the fibers, the denture doesn't dislodges when the buccinator muscle gets activated. Hence the denture stays there and is able to take stress upon it. Shape of the supporting structures. The maxilla becomes smaller in size as the resorption progresses. It resorbs in upwards and inwards direction. This is because of the direction and inclination of the roots of the tooth. In mandible, the opposite happens and it becomes progressively wider. You can see in this illustration, after the tooth removal, after the tooth removal, consider this as a, as a reference line. After the tooth removal, you see in subsequent images, the ridge moves far away from this reference line in the maxilla. Whereas in the mandible, also it moves far away. In case of mandible, it moves outwards, whereas in case of maxilla, it moves inwards. Also in case of maxilla, it moves upwards the bone level if you can see first it was here and at the end it is here so it's moved upward 
whereas in case of mandible it moves downwards you can see in this first image it is at this level and in this image the last image after the option it is at a lower level another illustration to show you the resorption pattern in maxilla and mandible you can very well see in this image the resorption level first the level was the level of bone was up to here but as resorption progresses it's come up to here so basically you can see that the pattern of resorption is upwards and inwards in case of maxilla whereas in case of mandible you can see the bone level first it was somewhere around here and now it has reached down and the bone level rise somewhere around here so you can see the pattern is outwards and downwards outwards and downwards shape of the supporting structures some anatomic variations also affect the shape of the supporting structures mylohyoid ridge mental foramen genian tubercles and torus mandibularis these all can very well affect the shape of the supporting structures mylohyoid ridge it's a bony prominence along the lingual aspect of the mandible anteriorly it lies close to the inferior border of the mandible whereas posteriorly one would see that after a certain amount of resorption it lies almost as flush with the superior surface of the residual ridge in this picture you can see the mylohyoid line this is the lingual view of the mandible you can see the mylohyoid li line here it turns downward in the anterior region to upwards in posterior region clinical significance the mucosa over the mylohyoid ridge may get traumatized by the denture unless relief is provided the more the resorption of mandible takes place the closer to the crest of the residual ridge the mental foramina will lie there is a possibility that the mental nerves and the vessels may be compressed by the denture the clinical significance is that the compression of the nerves by the denture may cause numbness of the lower lip this is the reason why relief should be provided in this area genial tubercles they lie away from the ridge it becomes clinically significant only if too much resorption of the mandible takes place and tubercles becomes too prominent and have to be relieved in this picture you can see the genial tubercles this is the lingual view of the mandible you can see the genial tubercles near the inferior border in the middle of the mandible torus mandibularis they are the bilateral bony prominence on the lingual side of premolars the overlying mucosa is quite thin the clinical significance the tori don't let the lingual flanges of the denture to be extended to the desired level and the thin mucosa gets traumatized very frequently the only treatment is surgical excision so that you can extend the flanges of the denture properly anatomy of peripheral limiting structures the action of limiting structures in mandible is difficult to recall structures on buccal as well as lingual side influence the denture you can see in this image there are structures present both buccal and lingual to the crest of the ridge buccally we see presence of the sulcus and frenum lingually we see the floor of the mouth the lingual frenum floor of mouth is very dynamic in nature and creates a challenge for the dentist to record the lingual border the labial vestibule extends from buccal frenum of one side to the buccal frenum of the other side it's divided into left and right halves by the labial frenum labial vestibule the extent of denture flange is affected by mentalis muscle a fibrous band attaches labial frenum to orbicularis oris muscle this makes the frenum active denture has to be relieved carefully in this region on opening the mouth the sulcus becomes narrow due to stretching of orbicularis oris hence a proper impression will be narrowest in the anterior labial region 
we see that orbicularis oris influences this region to quite an extent. In this picture, we see the labial frenum. The notch in the denture should be narrow and U shaped. This is how a notch should be narrow and U shaped. The notch should not be wide and V shaped, it should not be like this. This notch should be narrow and U shaped. Buccal vestibule. The buccal vestibule extends from buccal frenum to the retromolar pad area. The buccal part of the denture which extends into buccal vestibule is called buccal flange. Buccal vestibule is influenced by buccinator muscle. The denture should completely cover buccal shelf despite the fact that it will rest directly on the fibers of the buccinator muscle. In this illustration, you can see the denture overlying the buccinator muscle fibers. This is the denture. This is the denture border. And these are the fibers of the buccinator muscle. You can see the denture is overlying the buccinator muscle fibers. These fibers, as you can see in the images, they are horizontal in orientation and also thin and slack in this region. Hence, the muscle fibers on contracting do not dislodge the denture even if extended over external oblique ridge by a few millimeters. In this picture, we see the buccal frenum. The notch made in the denture should be wide and V shaped to allow for activity of muscle attached to at the frenum. The notch in this area should be like this, wide and V shaped and it should not be narrow and U shaped in this area. In this illustration on the left we can see attachment and insertion of masseter muscle on the skull. The distobuccal border of the denture is influenced, influenced by the masseter muscle. On the right side is a cross section in which we can see how the contraction of masseter muscle creates a pressure on the fibers of buccinator muscle and cause a groove on the soft material used to record borders. This is called masseter groove. You can see how the masseter muscle which is marked in green the borders are marked in green. It will cause a dent in the buccinator muscle, which is marked in blue, sky blue color. And this in turn will create a notch in the denture. Or in this case, in the impression material with which we are recording that area. Area affected by the masseter muscle. This is the view of impression surface to show the area affected by the masseter muscle. The area is marked bilaterally by the right brackets. Distal extension of the denture. It's limited by the ramus, buccinator fibers, lateral bony boundaries of retromolar fibers. The desirable distal extension is slightly lingual of bony prominences and includes the retromolar pad. The retromolar pad is a triangular soft pad of tissue at distal end of mandibular ridge. The contents of retromolar pad are loose alveolar tissue, glandular tissue, pterygomandibular raphe, fibers of buccinator, superior constrictor muscle, and terminal part of tendon of temporalis muscle. The last four are the muscles. The action of these muscles limit the extent of the denture and prevents placement of extra pressure during the impression procedure. The denture base should extend approximately one half to two thirds of the retromolar pad. Extending the borders to include the retromolar pad completes the soft tissue border seal. Hence receives an important landmark. The lingual border may be a little tricky to record. This is because the lingual tissues are easily distorted while making impression. To fabricate the denture with good lingual extensions, the action of myeloid muscle must be understood. The myeloid muscle extends from myeloid ridge to the hyoid bone. 
you can see in this image the myeloid muscle extends from the myelohyde ridge to the hyoid bone. Also in this picture you can see the, the myeloid muscle extends from myeloid ridge to the hyoid bone. The muscle on the anterior region does not affect the lingual border extension. In posterior region, the muscles are in relaxed state and they don't resist impression material. Due to this, an overextended border may be created. Overextension will cause soreness due to resulting overextended tension. Hence, flange must be made parallel to the myeloid muscle in contracted state. Retromyelohyoid fossa. Lingual flange in this area is not affected by the myeloid muscle. Hence, it moves back towards the body, producing S curve of lingual flange. The retromyelohyoid fossa is bounded by retromyelohyoid curtain. The region of retromyelohyoid curtain influences the distolingual flange of the mandibular denture. Two muscles that influence the denture border in this region of retromyelohyoid curtain are superior constrictor of pharynx and the medial torigoid. You can see in this image, this is the superior constrictor muscle, behind it is the medial pterygoid muscle, so medial pterygoid muscle will exert some influence on superior constrictor muscle when it is contracted, that is when the medial pterygoid is in action it will produce a bulge in the superior constrictor muscle which in turn will affect the posterior border of the denture in this area. Sublingual gland region. The sublingual gland rests above the myeloid muscle. It is obvious that when floor of the mouth is raised, the gland comes quite close to the crest of the ridge and reduces the vertical space available for extension of the flange in anterior part of mouth. You can see in this image, this is the myelohyoid muscle attached to the hyoid bone here. Above it lies the sublingual gland. Similarly, you can see the sublingual gland present here also above the myelohyoid muscle. Clinical significance The gland may be pushed by resistant pressure material. To avoid this, shape the flange to slope inwards toward the tongue. And make final impression with a low viscosity material which will not push the gland too much because of the less pressure exerted by the low viscosity material. Lingual frenum. Lingual frenum should be recorded in function because at rest the height of its attachment may be deceptive. Here you can see this is the tongue, the ventral part of the tongue. Here is the Lingual frenum. It's attached to the crest of the residual alveolar ridge, which is here. This means that at rest, you may feel that the frenum is attached at a low level, but during function, it reveals its actual level of attachment and it may just dislodge the denture and hence should be recorded properly. Alveolingual sulcus. Space between the residual ridge and the tongue is called as alveolingual sulcus. It extends from lingual frenum to the retromyelohyoid curtain. It can be divided into three regions anterior, middle, and posterior region. You can see the black bracket marks the anterior region, the red bracket marks the middle region, the yellow bracket marks the posterior region. One can see that in the middle region, flange is turning medially, this way, it's turning medially towards the tongue. And posterior region, the flange is turning laterally, away from the tongue, towards the crest. In anterior region, Premolar heart posa is present. The lingual flange 
is shorter anteriorly than the posteriorly in this region. Middle region, if the flange is sloped towards the tongue, then it can be extended below the malar head ridge. That is the reason why we see the flange was moving medially. In posterior region, the flange passes into retromalar fossa and is no longer influenced by the myeloid. Hence, it turns laterally towards the ramus or towards the crest and forms S form of lingual flange. So, we can see that a clear understanding of the anatomic landmarks of the mandible will help the clinician to recognize the challenges the different cases may present and manage appropriately which will eventually will help the clinician to deliver the good processes. Thank you for watching the video.